faith-based, community-driven streaming media, this is The Voice 17104.com from the Allison Hill District of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Now broadcasting community radio from Studio A and community television from Studio B on The Voice 17104.com. Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to the Richard James Show on 17104, The Voice. Greetings and salutations. Welcome once again to the Richard James Show. You know, at least once a month, I like to do a show on the motherland, Africa. I like to lift up icons, talk about situations that exist in Africa. Also go back in the history of Africa. Uh, one notorious thing was the Berlin Conference that happened in the late 1800s on which Belgium, Britain, Portugal, France, some of the other nations call themselves dividing up somebody else's land. Uh, between them. And the worst one, according to historical account, was Belgium. They were absolutely horrible. But today we're going to uh, deal with an individual who I've constantly admired for a long, long, long time. We're going to look at the legacy and history of Kenya's Tom Maboya. Now you've heard of a lot of African leaders and some of you have uh, are really well versed in terms of individuals like Jomo Kenyatta, for example. Well versed in terms of Guam and Kuma, uh, Nelson Mandela and many other great and formidable African leaders. Well, I'm gonna lift up one of the founding fathers of African unity. A young man at the time who worked very closely with Kwame Nkrumah in the development of the African Union. And he himself, and he was very young at the time, he himself at the time, was a union leader in Kenya. He is a Kenyan, born and raised in Kenya. And I had the fortune to be friends with his brother. Now let me tell, me, tell you something that uh, Tom Aboya did. Tom Aboya had communication skills that were fantastic. And he was able to develop relationships with our civil rights movement. He was good friends with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. In fact, he attended a civil rights rally. You're gonna hear some of this on a video that we're gonna play. And he also uh, developed a relationship with John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Can you believe that? And he was concerned always with the education African people, particularly his own. And I'm um, wondering, I think his brother may have been a part of that. What they did was lift up scholarships and they had what was called an airlift. You're gonna learn some of this on the video. With 800 students going from Kenya uh, to the United States of America to get a wonderful education. Can you believe that? And that was back in 1959. And that was a flight in which these uh, 800 people were airlifted. And one of the individuals that were part of that program to help to put that program together was a man by the name of Barack Obama, senior. The father of the former president of the United States was more than a local politician. He was a man that cared about people, just like his son did. 
and he was a part of that fight. Some of, that stuff, some of these things you will see in the video. He was one of the leaders. He organized unions in Kenya. He had these kinds of skills that allowed him to communicate people at all levels. And though he loved his people and lifted up the banner for freedom, justice, and equality for African people, he had no hatred, no hatred for Caucasian people. As a matter of fact, he was just the opposite. He said that anyone who called Kenya his home and is a citizen of Kenya has to be treated with equality, with dignity. And I totally agree with him. We have no place in this world for racism. We have no uh, place in this world for revenge. We want to lift up the banner of freedom, justice, and equality for all people. And this is what the man called Jomo, not Jomo, I'm sorry, Tom Aboya. That's what he did. I got to tell you something about, uh, and I may have mentioned this to you in the past, I don't know. But Swarthmore College, Tom Aboya's brother was a student at Swarthmore College. Uh, what was I doing at Swarthmore College? Well, I was trying to save up money to get in college myself. I was a busboy. I washed dishes. Don't feel shame about it. Langston Hughes was a dishwasher. Somebody that great washed a few plates. I don't mind washing a few plates myself. And I did, quite a few. And made some really, really tremendous friends washing dishes. And uh, I would talk to students, whistle while you work, talk while you work. And my boy it was one of the friends that I had developed. And at the time, I lived in the city of Chester and I attended a church called Bethany Baptist Church. And my boy went to church with me one Sunday morning. And he was absolutely thrilled. He said, Richard, he said, this is just like being home. I said, well, same people. Same people uh, in Chester, uh, in Nairobi, uh, Congo. We are all African people. And though we may move across the ocean, we are still the same culture. We still uh, lift up. Uh, justice, freedom, and equality. He loved it. And he was just a great guy. We were friends. Something tragic happened later on. Eventually, and I'm going to say this and then I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Eventually, Tom Aboya was assassinated. People blame a lot of folks for that. Some people blame uh, Jomo Kenyatta. Some people blame uh, the white races. Uh, there was a revolutionary group that existed during that period of time. Now I don't wanna just repeat what the uh, video is gonna show you, but they call themselves the Mau Mau's. The Mau Mau and white press depicted them as terrorists as racist and as very, very terrible people in spite of the fact that their lands and their homes uh, were being destroyed by colonial enemies. And their riches have been robbed and drafted by colonial uh, individuals. But yet the, the person that fights for the freedom and tries to lift up the banner of freedom, justice and equality are the ones that are blamed for their, for their problems. Kenya, very close to Ethiopia, very close to the uh, Sudan on the east coast of, uh, of Africa. It has a rich, rich history. And uh, Jomo Burning Spear Kenyatta, who was a member of the Kukuya tribe, uh, worked diligently 
to free Kenya. And by the way, it's no small thing, but Jomo Kenyatta spent nine years in prison for fighting for freedom. And you're gonna tell me these colonials were the good guys? You come in, you steal my gold, you steal my land, you take over my country, and then you call me the bad guy because I'll run you out. I think if you only had good sense, you would do the same and you would. Tom Maboya, known for his oratory, his ability to speak publicly, known for his ability to get along with people and to communicate with people. And they, these folks in America fell in love with Tom Maboya. They didn't like some other Africans, but one guy that they really liked was Tom and Joe. Because of those interpersonal skills that Tom had, he talked with people. He had no hatred in his heart for people. The only thing that man was freedom, justice, and equality. That was Tom Awoya, and that was Tom Awoya's uh, history. And if you read anything about Tom Awoya, that's what you're gonna read. Well, I'm gonna cut it off and I'll be back. Uh, right now, we're going to do a video, uh, the Tom Maboya documentary. We have always stated that um, our independence cannot be complete if, in fact, there is any part of the world where the black man is not accorded his right. I think the first thing we should know about Ndara is that uh, he was born in, uh, in a particular environment which made him not value being a rule very much. His father, of course, had been forcibly recruited under what they used to call agreement, but they will call agree meeting. Mm -hmm. hmm? Taking to Ruiru, near Baker, to work on social plantation. That's where Mboya was born. He learned Kikuyu, learned Kamba, not uh, later on learned Dulu, Kiswahili in English. Set to primary, some primary school in Ukambani. learning a lot about the campus. So here is somebody at a time when most people had they were brought up in their own communities, being brought up on a central plantation, and then later on, likely by Kikuyu, Kamba, uh, and later on, he came to St. Mary's from Kamba, he came to St. Mary's here, and then from there, of course, it could not, the father could not afford, uh, went to train as a, so, here is somebody who, who has a background different from most Africans at that time, mm -hmm. who were brought up in their own area, went to their school in that area. Mm -hmm. So that's the first major uh, distinction. When he finished uh, training at uh, uh, Kabete as a sanitary inspector, he was employed by Nairobi City Council. That's the day time my mouth started. And most African leaders were arrested. Some detained, some killed. To Africans, the Mau Mau were freedom fighters, but to the Europeans, they were terrorists. For it is that band of fanatics whose bloody deeds have cast a dark shadow across the face of Kenya. The British used the police and army to round up suspects from the Kikuyu villages. They dropped 50,000 tons of bombs to try to destroy their camps. The Mau Mau who tried to shoot down the British planes were celebrated as folk heroes.
The Mau Mau concluded there was no alternative to violence. They used homemade weapons to terrorize European settlers, attacking isolated farmhouses and police stations. Many Africans opposed the violence, including Jomo Kenyatta. Despite a lack of evidence, he was accused of Mau Mau links and imprisoned. 80,000 suspects were detained and interrogated. So he suddenly found himself in this vacuum again. Yeah, and he volunteered to be director of information and acting treasurer. Of course, people like Odede and Abori had tried, Odede was again also cleared and detained. So most people feared being, having anything to do with the cow, or less to go. When, uh, when Mao Mao was on the rampage and Jomo Kenyatta was acceptable because Kenyatta seemed to be so irresponsible and Boya became responsible. He became acceptable, responsible, you know, and made everybody happy. So they supported him, they backed him up, made him prominent throughout the world. An equal citizen with everybody else. Well, Mr. Mboya, uh, it's small for, it's hard for small nations to live alone. Do you hope for your country a federation with other small African, middle African nations? What is it that you want for the future? The All African People's Conference discussed this whole question of federations or a United States of Africa. And we are being realistic in this matter by our decision at Accra that certain regions constitute workable units that might be treated together in terms of economic planning, in terms of various social or economic uh, programs, and also with the hope that in uh, trying to achieve this, certain political units could be created. We have as a long-term objective the possibility of a United States of Africa. Would you affiliate with the Arabs or the northern half of Africa? In our present um, attitude, we regard that countries like Egypt, Tunisia. In the assembly, you said Europeans should scram out of Africa. Now, what did you mean by that? I am very glad that you raised this point because I think it is often difficult for us to be sure that we are correctly reported. And I want to take this opportunity to say exactly what I said. I said at Accra that in contrast to the 90, uh, to the 1884 Berlin Conference, the Accra Conference was convened to unite Africa to create the African community. And whereas the Berlin Conference started what history has referred to as the scramble for Africa, in Accra we were meeting to state in definite terms to the colonial powers, not European individuals, to the colonial powers, that they would have to scram out of Africa. I have also heard you reported as saying that you are not for Africa for Africans only, that all would be equal before the law. Is that true? This is true, except I want to qualify that statement by saying, whereas Africa for Africans is quite uh, a logical and uh, a satisfactory phrase to use, the qualification is that it is dependent on one's defense to take on a new role to stand for the things which she Well, it's, uh, it, uh, it is pretty obvious that um, the British and uh, Belgian governments have been very much involved in the uh, conspiracy in uh, the secession of Katanga. It uh, appears to us 
uh, those of us who have uh, looked at the Katanga situation, that the British and Belgian governments, including the French government to some extent, and Portugal, are very much interested in safeguarding the uh, various interests, financial and business interests, and mining interests, in Katanga, rather than in the protection and safeguarding of the national uh, security and unity of the Congolese people. Now, sir, uh, you as a leading uh, pan-Africanist have always objected to foreign interference in Africa. Now, wouldn't you say that the United Nations campaign against Katanga and against Mr. Shombe amounted to foreign interference? Not at all. On the contrary, the United Nations was invited to the Congo by the central government. This, the United Nations did not intervene until invited. And at present, they are acting in the Congo, firstly on the advice of the African states at the United Nations, and secondly, on the advice and in consultation and cooperation with the central government of the Congo. Our criticism has been that the United Nations has been restrained too much in its act actions in Katanga by world powers. That again includes Britain, Belgium, France. from Africa, Tom Maboya of Kenya. A human struggle. The struggle in Africa is one for nothing less and nothing more than the eradication of poverty, disease, and ignorance. And in this context, you and ourselves are all engaged in the same struggle that can aptly be summarized in terms of a struggle for political freedom, for economic opportunity, and for human dignity. This is my message to you. And I and millions of other people join you today in solidarity for the success of the struggle in which we are all involved. Thank you. A voice from America. Martin Luther King. As I stand here and look out upon the thousands of Negro faces and the thousands of white faces intermingled like the waters of a river, I see only one face, that is the face of the future. this great historic assembly, this unprecedented gathering of young people, I cannot help thinking that a hundred years from now, the historians will be calling this not the peak generation, but the generation of integration.
it was 1959 when I learned that there was a program between Honorable Mboya and the Kennedy of the United States of America. I didn't know what to do when I was taking my studies. I inquired the program. I was told it's an arrangement between Honorable Mboya, late Mboya, with the President Kennedy that uh, children or students who did not have an opportunity to continue with, their, uh, with education here in Kenya can apply from uh, American colleges and universities. And when they are admitted, the Kennedy's family will airlift the students to America. It so happened that I had just finished my, my London matriculation call, uh, examination, of which I was accepted by the same program to go to America. We were picked from different areas and we met in the plane. And it was difficult to know who is who going where until we arrived in New York Four of us, four boys, Frank Namtete, Samuel Ngola, and Elliston Kiwinda Mongola. And by we were uh, announced to be boarding to Little Rock, Arkansas. My flight is a famous one. It's, it was my through media nicknamed the great famous flight of 81 students. I'm thankful for American education and the arrangement made by Mboya and Kennedy that not only myself, many of the Kenyans who came back after that program came to teach Others went in the government to do something else, and I think the program is, if I can say, if I know any program was uh, geared to open the, the relationship between the Kenya government and the American government. And today we are proud to say from 1959, because I traveled with a gentleman called Obama, who is the father of the President of the United States, the program can continue if I may uh, be asked. Kenyatta University College, I was appointed by the Teacher Service Commission to go and complete a program called S1 Teachers uh, to teach secondary schools. I went over there, completed it, 1975. So I was transferred to Thogoto Teachers College. Thogoto Teachers College, I have taught 13 years. That's where I was as a lecturer, uh, chaplain, and the head of religious de department for 13 years. Then I retired. Kenyatta has just been allowed to give his first press conference since his conviction nine years ago. As long as I can see, you know, the frontier is very behind. I don't, I don't think Kenya is able to get independent at this moment, but unless another 20 years time, you are impaired next year, and Kenyatta must be released immediately. Any time, even now, if possible. Any time at all? Any time. Well, I think as a businessman, and I think I can 
also talk for the majority of other business people. Well, the sooner the better. But of course, there is a big if about it. We've got to have responsible people that are fit to govern us. For the moment, the crisis seems to have eased. But among the white settlers in Nairobi and the surrounding countryside, the memory still remains of the 95 Europeans and hundreds of Africans who were hacked to death in the days of Mau Mau violence. If Europeans stay on, will there be more violence? If they leave, will there be another Congo? At both ends of the scale, views are strong. Feelings run high. Can there be a compromise or must there be a collision? The answer to this depends, I think, on two factors. Will the Africans pause for a moment in the race for independence to realize that in their own best interest, they must make it attractive for Europeans to stay on? And for their part, are the Europeans ready in their heart of hearts to accept that Kenya is not a county of the British Isles, but part of a rapidly evolving Africa? Last here comes Kenyatta, flown from detention in Maralal and driven on the last stage of his journey in a police vehicle. He's surrounded by reporters and he gives an impromptu press conference on the steps of his new home. My first message to my people will be to thank them for what they have done for me and to ask them to keep calm. Uh, that is, not to make any trouble uh, in their rejoicing for my return. And um, uh, through there we can build a united Kenya. Mr. Kenyatta, do you think you'll be able to form a political party uniting Kanu and Kadu? I do not recognize, uh, I mean, favor one of them. I say I belong to both of them. What are your political ideals, Mr. Kenyatta? What is your political philosophy? <laughs> My political philosophy. Well, uh, I think my political philosophy is, well, if I can say, love thy neighbor as thyself. <laughs> Who is your neighbor? Uh, I think the world is my neighbor. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Vervoort once described his policy as good neighborliness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that can be sorted out. If it's made possible for you to take a seat in LegCo in the Parliament, would you do that? There again, I cannot put myself in LegCo. That, I leave that to my people. If they elect me to sit in LegCo, I would gladly do so. Would you like to do that yeah. soon, if possible? As soon as my people want me to do it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest problem facing Africa today? There's many big problems facing Africa today, uh, Africa today. That is, one, we must eliminate ignorance. Two, hunger, disease. Those are the, um, I mean, many other uh, problems, but I think those are the uh, most important. Kenya is a poor country, and its best future probably lies in the idea of an East African Federation with Uganda and Tanganyika and possibly Zanzibar. One measure of Kenyatta's success will be whether Kenya manages to achieve that. Good night.
Lancaster House has staged many colonial conferences, but this was the first one with picturesque touches. Headdresses with lion's mane cloaks indicate the importance of the tribal leaders. The conference discussed the future of Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta, perhaps the outstanding African in his country, desires a central government. Mr Ngala, his chief opponent, prefers a federation of regions not dominated by the Kikuyu tribe. The present governor is Sir Patrick Renison. Colonial Secretary Reginald Maudling hopes for a constitution that will guarantee equality before an impartial law, as well as freedom from fear and oppression. Gentlemen, this conference is of crucial importance to the future of Kenya. Upon the degree of our success or failure will depend the well-being, the livelihood, and perhaps even the physical safety of all the citizens of Kenya of whatever race or creed. This is the measure of the responsibility that now rests. We have certainly not solved the problems of Kenya, but I believe we can claim that this conference, by reaching this agreement, has made it possible to find a solution to the problems of Kenya. Throughout the conference, my party and I never, uh, uh, my party and I never de de deviated uh, from these objectives. And our primary concern at every moment has been the future welfare of our country, economic, political, as well as social welfare. Uh, it is because I believe uh, this so strongly that after every, uh, after very careful consideration, I have agreed to the formation of a coalition government. Looking back today, I am glad to be able to say that Kanu is proud of its contribution at this conference. We are fully prepared to complete, to cooperate in the task ahead and invite all other parties and sections to work with us in this noble task. It is necessary that I state clearly at this juncture that Khan shall not tolerate any effort or maneuver to slow down Kenya's independence. We believe that Kenyans are one nation. It is also consistent with the African people's past and present efforts to secure unity. It is also the logical answer to the challenge which Kenya or, or any new nation must face after independence. The consolidation of independence, urgent economic reconstruction and development, the need to make an impact and have influence at Pan-African and international affairs must be our immediate aim. What we have been struggling for is to redeem our country from the yoke of colonialism.
Harambe! 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 Na mashamba yetu harambe! Na mefugo yetu harambe! Na sirikali yetu tukumu harambe! Well, we inherited a certain situation. It is not of our making. For example, most of the good farming land in the highlands was reserved originally for European farmers. So we have to bring Africans into this area. Uh, most of commerce and trade has been monopolized by Asians, and we now have to bring Africans into this area. Well, this expression cannot just be defined in one word because uh, it represents a lot of things. It represents, for example, our belief that in Africa, the kind of economic, social and political institutions that make sense must find their meaning in the African setup. Uh, that any new organization which we bring up must be based on some traditional concept to life. Uh, it must not just be imported from outside. For example, we are uh, uh, clan-minded, we are tribal-minded, in that we are communal in our concept of life. Now, it is necessary that our new institutions are based on this approach, what we have called in our definition of African socialism, mutual social responsibility. That is, that a person it's not just an individual, he's part of a system, he's part of a community. He has responsibilities within that community. He has duties to perform in that community. But in turn, the community has also got responsibility to him. They have duties towards him and his children. Um, this is a very important concept. The other concept is that every person has got equal value and, and worth. Although some of our people in tradition, traditional life, had a lot of wealth, but their wealth was not really belonging to them as individuals. They held it almost in trust for the rest of the community. And when any of the members of the community got into trouble, or when he wanted um, uh, cows to pay dowry, he always looked to this as a position which he could also have access to. So that there is this element acknowledging freedom, justice, and equality. Now you know where the term Harambe comes from. We have a church, a king, kingdom assembly that was once called Harambe. The ones had a very, very strong mission in Kenya. And I see where they learned the term. Tom Aboya left his earmark on the legacy and the history of his homeland. And also the world. You can see that he developed a relationship with Barack Obama Sr. He developed a relationship with John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And John Fitzgerald Kennedy established a lift, we call it, 800 students were transported from Kenya to go to school and get their education, higher education, in the continental United States. And Tom Aboya was a man 
of peace and love. But you gotta do what you gotta do in order to survive, in order to uh, take back what that which is yours. And that conference that took place, I think it was 1894, a number of white nations just sit down on the drawing board and carved up Mother Africa, giving it to each other. And a lot of people died supporting this. Some leaders were murdered uh, by Europeans. Interesting, we had a long history of fighting the Cubans. Che Guevara was murdered uh, in the Congo. Uh, I think we can guess pretty much who took his life. Patrice Lumumba, the first prime minister for the Republic of the Congo was also murdered and it became very obvious if you watched their film, who called for the murder of Patrice Lumumba. Tom Aboya was assassinated in Kenya in the marketplace. Assassinated, murdered, killed at a very, very young age in which he had already accomplished numerous, numerous, numerous uh, feats within his own country. And so that's why we want you to Remember, Tom Aboya. You think about Nelson Mandela, you think about Guam and Kuma, you think about Gambo A. Nassau, you think about many of the African leaders. Uh, write Tom Aboya's name down and remember Tom Aboya because he contributed a lot to the world. He was friends with Malcolm X. He was friends with Martin Luther King Jr. He was friends with the Black people of the United, United States. And one of the people that got educated from Kenya was his own brother. Uh, he got educated at Swarthmore College, which at the time was the number one small college in the continental United States. I was blessed to, at that time, uh, work in the kitchen. And I established a program at Swarthmore College called the Chester Tutorial Project, uh, patterned after the Philadelphia Tutorial Project. And I hired students and hire them, I uh, uplifted students that tutored kids in Chester one on one, sometimes two or three, uh, and the Chester Tutorial Project. And out of that program came an organization called Upward Bound, which was funded throughout the country. And many students from different parts of the country uh, were able to go to college based on the kind of tutors that they got from Uncle Brian. And one of the people that came to Chester with me was Tom Aboya's brother. I will never forget him. I will never forget those wonderful, wonderful days. And by the way, uh, we're coming down to the uh, end of our program. And I try to uplift for you uh, my business, which helps to support this broadcast and other things that I try to do called African Paradise. And I reunited with an old so, friend of mine. Uh, and this is, this is a picture of my uh, stand. And you notice here we have uh, statues that are from Africa, big, huge statues. We have uh, original, original, original paintings. Uh, we have tall, tall uh, giraffes. We have oils. Come visit us down there. We need your help and we need your support. But this is African Paradise, uh, located at 35 South A Street in downtown uh, Lebanon. And we welcome you, we welcome you. And if you like African clothing, of which I'm wearing a, a dashiki at the time, we have suits, we have dashikis, we have the whole nine yards. And you know, our ultimate goal, when I say it straight up on TV, uh, I had for several years, I had an African museum uh, in Middletown and also had one down on Third, moved to Third Street. Uh, and I want to reopen my African museum. In that museum, we did uh, lectures, we did tours of the museum and brought students in. And we had some of the most beautiful artifacts that you ever want to see. 
and we're just getting in a lot of new, new artifacts, and you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it. Just come down to see me. We're open uh, Thursday mornings at eight o'clock, uh, eight to five thirty. Uh, Friday from eight to five thirty. Saturday from seven to three o'clock. And just look for African Paradise. We're right next to the front door. And if we don't have it, we can get it. Because we believe in uplifting the culture, uplifting our people. And uh, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It, uh, we have a lot of uh, Caucasian women that come and love our cap kings. They're loose fitting, they're multicultural, and they don't have a, uh, <laughs> an ethnic group written on it. Anyone put it on, it's going to look good. And so come on down and get it. Uh, Daishiki, we have those. The suits, we have those. Uh, we have over 500 bottles of oil. So you should be able to find your oil in that 500. Uh, and we, we have, like I said, these artifacts. And now I just got in. I went up to uh, New York with my uh, son-in-law, who is just a wonderful, wonderful young man. And I let him do the bar, and he's from Senegal, so he knew how to talk to these guys who are selling stuff. But I got a a truckload, I got a bunch of uh, drums, I got a bunch of djembe's, huge, huge, some of the largest djembe's I've seen that sound wonderful. So if you need in need of a new a djembe for some of these uh, uh, drumming circles, uh, you come see me. Richard James is the name, and uh, uh, education in Africa is my gang. So come on down to see me and, and get your drum, get your oil. Females, we got, we got jewelry. We got all kinds of things. And we are your friend and we're your neighbor. And so we look forward to uh, seeing you again next week, where we hope to have a very dynamic program and lift up a very prominent family, uh, City of Chester, but we won't get into that right now. We'll look, we'll look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Much love and much success. This is Richard James signing off. Uh, the Richard James Show. Thank you so much. Thank you again for tuning in to the Richard James Show, our African and our African American program are set up to educate you on what's going on in this world. We thank you for taking out the time to listen. Let us hear from you sometime also. So this is your neighbor and your friend signing off. And so I'll see you again next week. And hear from you again next week. So long. God bless.